Hello and welcome back to Wake and Jake. Happy baseball to all of you that celebrate. I hope you enjoyed the weekend of baseball back with your favorite team. I hope you enjoyed the sports world. I mean, March Madness in full tilt. Uh, shout out to the the women who will be balling tonight. It's literally... I'm not going to start with a sports as scripted because I sometimes I find myself in a dark hole thinking about that. Uh Hey, if you've been out of the women's college basketball game for a while, uh, Kaylin Clark, who she is her or him, I don't, I don't know if they've adopted that. Um, she's the chosen one. Uh, they're playing LSU, which Angel Reese, like their whole team, awesome. Um, my UConn women, love them. Uh, you know, they're UConn, they're playing USC, who they have one of the best players in the country. I didn't expect to do any of that, but check it out uh, because the men's college basketball was really good this weekend too. But we are talking baseball out the start. Opening weekend, instant reaction. My my brain was kind of here. Uh, and then Dave Schoenfeld, who have we ever met him or anything? Who are you? I don't you? think so. Who are you, Dave? Reach out. Guy in my town who grew up with with a similar name. Not it's not him because the guy I'm thinking of is the father of somebody I know. But I'm messaging passing right now. Who is Dave Schoenfield? I read his stuff um, because he came out with it's baseball. It's a long season. Uh, your past weekend can be erased instantly. You go on and win this next series. You reel off a week of wins and you're the New York Mets, and it it can all change. I don't know if they're the perfect team to do because I don't think it's all going to change there. Uh, he did an eight things we learned from this weekend. Uh, I'm making my own adaptation. I'm doing uh, kind of the five stories from the opening weekend of baseball that shook things up where I will compliment Dave, who I'm finding out who you are right now. It's where I wanted to start, and it's where I was going to start no matter what, because it is the New York Yankees. Uh, and if you don't want to hear it, I'm sorry, but you're about to, because we did an hour and a half on Talking Yanks. We opened up Talking Baseball with it, and we're doing Wake and Jake, too, because something special happened this weekend. Uh, the new-look New York Yankees went into Houston. They swept them for four games. The Houston Astros that have been uh, the Yankees' nightmare for the past seven years now. Uh, Minute made where there's a lot of bad memories. Uh, the Yankees went in. They came back the first three games coming off of a year of anemic offense. So that's the, you know, if you're checking boxes along the way with me. Uh, last year, the Yankees offense was atrocious. When you were looking at stats, the only teams that were worse were the Oakland A's. Were the Guardians last year? The the Tigers Offense last year, the stat page was awful. Uh, I mean, the Yankees' offense was atrocious. Whenever they'd go down in games, it just felt like it was over. A two-run lead felt... Everything felt double. A three-run lead on the Yankees last year felt like a six-run lead. Two and four, one and two. There's your math pod. Uh, so to come out and kind of slay the dragon on that in Houston, so that was the first box we checked, Unbelievable. Juan Soto. Uh, you have seen us being dramatic on the internet about it because, oh my God. Um, you try not to be overreactionary in baseball. There's 162 games, but it's the opening weekend. It's our first taste of the new ice cream flavor. It's fantastic. Or again, tragic if you're the Mets. Um, a little backhand. Whoops. Juan Soto's awesome. I I can't wait to watch it over 162. It's something that when we talked about free agency and how it's landed, uh, this is the reason, and it's part of the reason why talking Yanks uh, became successful off the rip, which has led into this whole company. Um, every... Player is different. Every guy has their own quirks, mannerisms, personality. And Juan Soto, again, this is a 4-0 Yankee weekend. So you're going to hear some ridiculousness. 
it felt like the best at bats I've ever seen. And and maybe that's dramatic, and maybe I won't be saying that. Maybe there will be a Wake and Jake episode in July where I'm like, okay. Um, you know, with the New York Yankees, who are some of the... We've gotten to see A-Rod. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is where I want to scope it down to Yankees in, in a non-knocking the Yankees ways. When you watch your team, you watch them every day. So if you're a, a throwback Orioles fan and you watch Cal Ripken every day, you'd be like, when? Cal Ripken. I haven't seen, I haven't seen guys play like that because you saw Cal Ripken play every day. What's another team? Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Andrew McCutcheon? I don't know. You probably as good you was pr- as good as they've seen. You watched him. Did he win two MVPs there? I think just one? the one win. But. but I mean, you got to see something pretty special day in, day out. And he's a guy with an awesome personality and a guy that had all five tools. Like, um, you know, whatever team you follow, you've watched a special player and they have more heartstrings with you. Um, Yankees, we've been lucky enough to see a ton of sick players, man. I mean, Jeter, Rod. Bernie, a lot of heartstrings there. Yeah. Tino, Robinson Cano. About to say Robbie. Um, you know, Hall of Fame level baseball players. Aaron Judge just broke the home run record. Mm-hmm. We watched a, a very special season. And maybe that's where Yankee fans get to uh, update from Jeff Passan. Uh, he's a dude who's, he's, he writes a ton and has been here for 20 years. Okay. In. Shout out Dave Dave Schoenfield. Uh and maybe that's what makes this feel even better is that Aaron Judge we watched him break the home run record. The team fell apart around him. But he was incredible. Uh I remember and I talked about it on here. I talked about it wherever I could. The feeling and I was glad Judge talked about it after the season. He hit a double there's a standing ovation before his at bat. I think he was at 59 home runs. And he hit a double. And there weren't boos in the stands, but there was that negative murmur. Like when this is, ah, yeah, yeah, ah. It was unbelievable. I've never seen a double, a double met with that response. <laughs> um, like I can't even imagine. No, because I was just going to say someone going for the cycle. But if someone going for the cycle hits a double... I don't know. You're kind of. It's a big part of it. You're kind of daydreaming for a second. Um, Aaron Judge, who has incredible plate discipline, uh, you know, a really good on base percentage, broke the home run record in front of our eyes. What Juan Soto did this past weekend, I don't want to say was more impressive. (laughs) Aaron Judge broke the American League home run record. Sorry, Barry. Um, The pitcher in baseball for years has been in control of the driver's seat. And every now and then you see a batter take over and it's like, oh, shoot, watch this. Like, this pitcher doesn't have anything for this hitter right now. This hitter is in control. That's a pretty rare feeling in baseball. Every Juan Soto at bat felt that way. Um, So if you're someone who was a Nationals fan... You're hearing all this, and you might be laughing to yourself. Uh, Maybe you're laughing because there's another shoe that's going to drop. Like, maybe maybe parts of this season, Juan Soto's going to lose focus. He's definitely going to slump every baseball ever. Every baseball player ever has slumped. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the other side looks like, but I know what this side looks like, and especially in a contract year, playing for the pinstripes. Um... Which, if you think it doesn't matter, I don't know if I've shared this before because I didn't want to blow up his spot, but he got a new contract. I, I don't know, because I'm interested to see because I talk so much I forget what I say. I went to a famous wedding this summer, Flex, Cole Oops. Tucker, Vanessa. Congrats to them still. Um, and I you know, told you guys a little bit, me and Chris Archer broke out hard to the point Jess was like, hey, you kind of have to cut it out. Um, Jack Flaherty's there, me and Jack, you kind of opposite personalities, but man, we had a good time. We had a blast. My first time with Tyler Glass now, Chris Rose rotation. 
uh, you know, we'd message a little bit. He's good friends with Cole, so we'd BS'd about Tyler before. Uh, we have a nice time. We're talking a lot of baseball. And, uh, again, during the wedding, it was a phone-free ceremony, and this was Tyler Glass now was supposed to be traded. Like, prime time. Mm. Uh, which <laughs> kind of stunk, but, again, he's the person that couldn't care less about it. Uh, and the Yankees got brought up, and I... I think I got in a passionate speech, maybe even a little extra passionate with some tequila about Luis Castillo and Frankie Montas. That not even that the Yankees deserve to get Luis Castillo uh, because they got outbid and the Reds wanted Noel V. Marte. Fast forward. Um, that the Seattle Mariners got Luis Castillo. That was it. The Yankees side of things that was also a little crazy was if they traded for Luis Castillo, he was going to have to shave his head or get a haircut, Mm. which again, that comes the beard policy I'm half into. It's the Yankees. You're showing up for work. Shave your beard, son. Get out there. Guy's hair. I don't know. Like that's. It starts coming up against, like, a racial barrier of, like, Luis Castillo's got this awesome hair. You're going to make him cut it? And I don't know. Where do you start drawing lines in 2024, 2022 at the time? Uh, And Glass now, this is the part that I don't think I've shared before. (laughs) Because I think everyone started looking at him because they were like, you know, Tyler Glass now, you're on the trade block. You could be traded sometime. You have beautiful hair. Uh... And he kind of looked at everyone, and I was, I was glad because this feeling still very much resonates for me, and it's Yankee bullshit, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Tyler Glass now looked at everyone at the table, and he goes, if I get traded to the Yankees, I'm cutting my hair. They're the Yankees. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point, people. So if you don't like them, good. You're not supposed to like the Yankees. <laughs> Those were some of our texts in our in our Talking Yanks group chat this week. It was like, oh, man, guys are going to hate the Yankees this year, bro. They posted all their watches after the game. Uh, you know, Strowman's uh, a not, <laughs> not well-received guy if he's not on your team. Verdugo can rub some feathers. The way Soto plays, man, it's the most confident thing I've ever seen a hitter do on a baseball field while being natural, like not trying to be douchey. It, it doesn't feel like he's, like, choosing to do something extra. No. Like he's just like, hey, man, I'm in this at bat with you. Let's dance. Like it's all, You guys know I'm in a Game of Thrones kick, so some of you might get this, but it's like it's Arya learning from her dance partner in season one. It's hmm. like, hey, we're here. Like, let's kind of, let's boogie a little bit. Let's groove. Um, I think the Yankees are going to be hated this year, and I, that's a good thing for Yankee fans. Um, because if the Yankees are hated, that means they're good. Juan Soto's already, com- you know, he basically dropped his they don't boo the bad players lines. He expects boos because um, he's that good. The other thing is, Judgey barely participated this series offensively. Same with Glaber Torres, who those two were the only offense last year. Um, some hero ball efforts from Oswaldo Cabrera. <laughs> You're not sure how much that's going to continue, but looked nice. Nice to see for a series because he didn't have a lot of those last year. Um, Verdugo looked fine. Rizzo's back, uh, and he didn't go go nuts. Um, but, man, the New York Yankees had a swagger to them. Incredible at bats up and down the lineup. A little small ball, some power. Uh, Volpe looked incredible. It would be interesting to see if he's in the lineup tonight. He had a bad case of the... Uh, the Mexico's, um, which I will say to him and whoever else on the Yankees gets sick. I had that Montezuma's revenge. I I don't, I think it's traditionally called that. Um, one of the worst 24 hours of my life. Whew. I didn't have insurance at the time. I thought about going to like a hotel in Mexico. I don't know. The dark, dark thoughts started spinning really hard. And then right around the 24 hour mark, um, I was, oh, I started getting better. There was a light. 
If I didn't get better at that point, I was going to a hospital. Enough about the poops. Um, the New York Yankees are the story from the opening weekend of baseball. I think on Talking Baseball, we used to get nervous about it. Like, A, we have a Talking Yanks show. So if you're hunting out Yankees on YouTube podcasts, you're already getting that. Yeah, which means agreed. you're a fan of another team, so you half hate the Yankees, so you don't want to hunt it out. On on our end, we've gotten to scratch our itch as far as like the, the baseline. Have we gotten to talk about this somewhere? The story from baseball opening weekend was the Yankees look good. Juan Soto looks incredible. The the trickle down effect to the team and at bats. If Anthony Volpe is the prospect he was supposed to be, and everyone was saying that already, his at bats look better. The Yankees have a real lineup. The Yankees have a real lineup. And I've done this speech on here. Go through any Yankee team that was good, their strength was their lineup. It's silly. When we do Yankee team drafts and Yankee all time drafts, when you start doing the pitching staff, it's Whitey Ford. It's Andy Pettit, who, like, don't get me wrong. I love Andy Pettit. He was a horse. He pitched forever. But when you're doing, like, pantheons of all-time pitchers. like Andy Pettit is, like, the, the all-time, like, number two pitcher. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Like, he's the, and there's the not quintessential, a lot of, like, that's your second best guy, which a lot of years he was. He, he's right. won the World Series, but like five you, times with him. I, Whitey Ford, Gator Gidry, like these pitchers pitched. When did when was Rod Ron Gidry's last season? Uh, I know he had some injury stuff, so he retired kind of young, but in the early eighties, I want to say. So he 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 fought for a little bit. He pitched till he was thirty seven, nineteen eighty eight. Ron Gidry never pitched an MLB game since I've been alive, um, and if. You get confused by my young, beautiful face. Um, he hasn't pitched a game since Jimmy's been alive either. So, boom, roasted both ways. <laughs> um, the Yankees, the Bronx Bombers, the short porch. Really good lefties, really good on base. That's one of the secrets of the Yankees dynasty. Like, they were kind of sneaky into on base before it was sexy. Although Oakland took all the credit for that. But they also had crazy power and crazy players and a bunch of borderline Hall of Famers, if not borderline Hall of Famers, with one of the best shortstops and the best closer ever. Um, and they're playing with a little bit of swagger. And to see Rodon perform enough that he can build off of it. Marcus Stroman, six innings, no earned runs. Like he's an MLB it, guy. It felt right. Like that was that was good, and the bullpen didn't give up a run. Which, when you look at that bullpen on paper, especially around the league, there's not a ton of flash to it or guys you might know. Like Johnny Luizic has been doing it for a while now, and Clay Holmes has been the Yankees' closer for a little bit. But you know, even those guys aren't like going back to the Yankee bullpen. That's Britain, Adovino. Um, there's Chapman. been years of like visibly stacked bullpens, and this isn't. The, the name value isn't there, but... The the whole team seemed like they were playing with a little bit of conviction that we haven't seen the Yankees play with in a little bit. So we are excited. People around the leagues are excited. And Juan Soto, man, he's 25 years old. He's 25 years old. Um, he's younger than Yankees rookie catcher Austin Wells. Um Whoever's well, on, we're here and we were shouting out pitchers like even Nestor's bad start. He rallied and gave length and finished strong and retired the last X number of, out of whatever. I was, I, almost everything was positive. The Yanks looked good, uh, and if we're being honest, uh, business wise for MLB the league, like when the Yankees are the Yankees, it's just good for baseball. Um, and the Yankees look like they're going to be the Yankees. So that was the number one in the article. Shout out Dave Schoenfield. It was the number one here. It was the number one to lead talking baseball story. Talking Yanks won a buck 37. Sometimes I question how dumb we can be because there's times at John Boy Media where we do some dumb stuff. 
just the facts of it. Um, I don't know. With the Yankees, we're pretty good on the pulse. No one, no one's holding back. No one's holding back. Uh, the Yanks looked really good. Um, and let's see what that means over the season. Uh, because that AL East, man, uh, I'll get to some of that in a second. Uh, my number two storyline, uh, I adapted some from, from Dave here, but I, I made this some my pivots own. pivots from there. I said the extremes are the extremes. Um, the Dodgers and the Braves, there is nothing that can slow those teams down. The Dodgers just stole a win out of the, from the Cardinals because they wanted to, because there was enough baseball left. They were down 4 nothing, I think, going into the sixth. And they were just like, you know, I think the, I think the Cardinals had used a decent amount of their pen over the weekend. Um, and just the, the thick, I guess that's the, the thick part of their lineup, the lineup that you're going to tell your grandkids about. Mookie. Shohei and Freddie Freeman. Yeah, that's silly. You know what else is silly? Like, the next tier is Will Smith, Max Muncy, and Teoscar Hernandez, who went off this weekend. When you get past that, it's James Outman or Chris Taylors or Hayward or Lux. Like, you already know, and that's why I, I wanted to label it the extremes or the extremes, but, like, them and the Braves, the Phillies stole a game from Atlanta, and that's how they're going to lose games this year. Um, I was I was really questioning things coming into the season because I was looking at last year's team profile and projections, and the New York Mets were the number two team. Uh, again, tough episode for the Mets. Uh, but the Mets ended up bombing last year, and, like, the D-backs won the World Series. They were, like, the 20th-ranked team. The Texas Rangers were around there, too, and it was like, oh, damn. How about that? Um, there was another top team from last year that ate it. Well, the Yankees. They were up there. Yankees, Mets. I want to say there was Cardinals. Cardinals were up there. Cardinals. I, I guess, in hindsight, the Mets are always the Mets. And that's, uh, that's just untouchable. Um, the Cardinals in the Central Division. I mean, the Cardinals just had a year from hell. The Yankees, it's funny looking back at the questions we had about last year's team that... Just didn't get answered. Um, the cream of the crop. The Braves are too big to fail. Um, Kelnick had a great weekend. He's their nine-hole hitter. Um, their pitching has crazy depth and talent. Uh, the Dodgers are in the same boat. Um, I think those are the only two teams I truly had as the too big to fail. Um and the other reason why I labeled this um, I labeled this category the extremes are the extremes. White Sox, A's, and Rockies. I mean, it's just nothing. Just nothing, man. Um, tough. It's crazy that the White Sox should be even lumped with those other franchises when a couple years ago the White Sox, we would have argued, are too big to fail the other direction with how good their pitching and their lineup looked like it was going to be. The Rockies are a joke. Um, I had a had a couple conversations about the, the Rockies this weekend. I, I kind of can't believe what they're doing as a baseball franchise. There's no strategy with their team. Like, look at the Rockies and tell me what, they, what they're supposed to do well. What are the Rockies supposed to do well? What exactly would you say you do successfully, quickly? They maybe run defense. A I don't think so. Who's running on that team? Rogers. It's like Rogers. Joe's was making fun of the way Rogers runs, and if you've seen Joe's run, um, maybe Long defense like Doyle, Tovar, McMahon, Rogers, Nolan Jones. Okay. Um, uh, they can they can pick it a little bit. They, their defense won't lose you the game. I know pitching's tough there, but how how have they not hired like whoever runs the Rays bullpen? Like there's there's somebody smart enough to figure it out in the world, and they haven't. The other team plays at course too, and I know while I'm saying this, I've been a course field defender, and 
uh, or on the Rockies side because it is tough when they go on road trips and it looks like pitches move more. But we also have new technology that it feels like we can be training for that and and getting better. I don't know. Um, the Rockies are directionless. When have the Rockies had? When have the Rockies been on like? No, every year they come out with like best farm systems. I've never seen the Rockies on that. Don't think so. Never. Um, I'm not, maybe like going back to like when Tulo was coming up. Like he was a big prospect. Was there a time when Tulo and player. Arenado were both prospects? And 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 by the way, is that the only time the Rockies have ever had success? Like, how is this team never fully invested in the farm, or how have they never paid more for free? There's just no direction. So that's my one of my annual Rocky rants. Uh, White Sox are down bad right now. I do think they have kind of like a rebuild plan. That The direction is there. It's one, of the uglier, it's one of the uglier rosters to just read through, particularly on the pitching end. And then Oakland, I mean, they you, you guys know, you what's, know what's going happening. on there. But. Um, so I, I think... Just seeing seeing those again after doing a year of analyzing what's on paper and this team looks good and, oh, they added this. Dodgers, Braves, too big to fail. You probably already knew that. The other teams are too bad to fail. <laughs> Houston, I know it's one weekend against the Yanks, and I'm not going to do this whole thing, but I don't know. I'm just leaving, I'm leaving the door cracked because... When we did that episode with Jolly, I think on Talking Baseball, all of us were doing like, could Houston's pitching be not as good this year? And it's one series. And the Yankees <laughs> had to come back in every game. Yeah. And and for, and frankly, the starters did well. But, but I don't know, man. I, I don't know. This Houston team had a, had a different scent to it to start the season. I'm not going there yet. Um, and then... I don't want to say everyone else is in the middle, um, and that actually might be one of my next talking points. Uh, no. I, my next talking point is, and I, I am taking assist from my guy Dave here, uh, you guys have heard me preach about this a lot. Offense is so in. I kind of don't care if you can pitch. I obviously care if you can pitch. Let's strike that and reverse it. But hitting is so important, especially in the regular season and maybe the postseason. Look at your Texas Rangers. Look at what the Snakes did in the postseason to get going. Look what the Phillies have been doing in previous years. Um, you know, Houston's had a core of their lineup to go along with a lot of pitching, to be fair. And the truth of it is you're going to need all of it. But hitting so in. Um, and I think, I know it was it was opening weekend, Um and my guy Dave Schoenfield will, again, have to meet at something. Uh, but offense was up over the weekend. Uh, from opening weekend last year uh, to this year, uh, batting average was up like five points. On base was up seven points, which uh, led to about a half a run more per game. And I don't know. I, I've just, I've been saying this a lot. I feel like I've said that too many times this episode. Um I think it's just where baseball is at. With where pitching is at and the technology, and if you're a pitcher and you can throw hard, we can find you a sinker that works. Um, we can probably find you another pitch that works. Like, we have the technology now that between bullpens, we can draw up what can work for a pitcher. That, like, there's not a lot of teams you go around baseball and you're just like, whoa, what's this pitching staff? A lot of guys throw really hard. Um, that a lot of pitchers can put it together for a day. Lineup-wise, a grindy lineup, I think that's my separator right now. And that's part of the reason I'm so excited about the Yankees and everyone's excited about the Yankees. Their at-bats were so good. The Baltimore Orioles, man, are just relentless. Relentless. Every at-bat. Uh, a guy is grinding and trying to hit a double on you. Um, other lineups uh, that stood out for me, very interested in San Diego's lineup. Like I mentioned with the good teams, I mean, the Braves and the Dodgers. Um, it's why I love the Cincinnati Reds, and it's why I've been, I've been passionate about it and banging the table for them all offseason. The Cincinnati Reds and why I think they can 
joined the party and they've been a little less respected than some of the other good teams in baseball. Top to bottom, man. We'll, look at what Will Benson has done. Look at what Encarnacion Strand has done. Jammer Candelario. Jake Fraley, who's subbing in off their bench. Nick Martini, who's subbing in off their bench. Spencer Steer, Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, Tyler Stevenson, I know he hasn't hit in a little bit, but there was a time when he was like baseball's young hitting catcher. He was like the catcher you'd start your franchise with for a year and change there. And I, I know he's been banged up. He's also 27, so like he, it's been one weekend of baseball. I think the ability, and this has happened over baseball, to every inning to grind out at bats, to not give pitchers that breather. I, I just think that's massive. I don't know if there's some pitch clock mixed in. I don't know what it is, but having a lineup that every inning is going out there and you're not you're not looking at the lineup and seeing, okay, rookie who's an easy out, catcher who's been an out, uh, and player who's slumping. Like I, I just think that cycle matters so much. It's why the Yankee weekend got hype. Go look at the Philadelphia Phillies lineup. I mean, what they are putting out there day in, day out. Uh, I have strongly believed, and I think it's starting to show more, you can kind of find pitching to just stumble into hitting doesn't happen. Like, think about who are some of the... I bet I could find MLB relievers right now that could come in and give you an inning. Where's Shane Green? I feel like he gets tapped into every MLB season. Yeah, there's, like, to a degree, pitching can be, I guess you need guys with the ability, but you, you can be coached and, and big brain a little bit, find the matchups you like, find the guy who can't hit this pitch, find, like, can't it, like you, you have to be a good hitter. I, I know there's the occasional platoon advantage and, and all that and the occasional plug and play. I, I just Streaks think... happen, but... On any given day, with how talented pitchers are, Let's look at the Angels, who get mocked at a lot. Um, you know, Patrick Sandoval, I know he had a tough opening day, but that guy's a really good major league pitching. Griff Canning, sure, he could give you a day at the office. Reed Detmers, why not? Chase Silseth, yep. Uh, in their bullpen, Estevez has been good. Uh, Soriano setting up, he's kind of jumped onto the scene. Matt Moore has been awesome the past few years. Luis Garcia, he had a moment in the postseason a couple years ago. Adam Sinber, Zuniga is in the pen for them. Remember WBC? That guy came out just chucking a bill. Um, and that's like the depth of the Angels' bullpen. Uh, you know, they've got guys at AAA. I've seen Kenny Rosenberg, Zach Plesak. I know Zach Plesak's fallen out and the baseball savant's ugly, but, like, that guy is just a AAA floating pitcher now. And on a given day, could he give you five innings? Absolutely. Getting guys up and down the lineup that can grind out at bats and give you a day, I just think that's become the tougher thing to find where it used to be finding an ace in a rotation, but almost that's out. Being an ace isn't an out. But you can find pitching and guys that can throw hard. I think to find guys that can give you at bats, I think that's tough. A's triple A, or excuse me, still on the Halos. Two, here's, okay. This ended up being the perfect example. Here's four guys in the Angels bullpen that if I told you were in the Major League bullpen, you'd be like, oh, okay. I, yeah. Ben Joyce, one of the top, top picks out of Tennessee, throws 100. Sure, Ben Joyce, currently at triple A. Jimmy Herget, friend of the company. Uh, he's been up and down, kind of in that reliever cycle. There's been times where he's been the setup man. There's been times when he's had some tougher times at the office. Whatever. Jimmy Herget can get you an inning. There's fun. Easy. He's gotten a lot of innings. Hunter Strickland, a John Boy Media favorite. He's pitched a, a, pitched a lot of baseball. Uh, Amir Garrett. In the AAA Angels pin. So this is the kind of pitching depth that I'm talking about. I'm sure Amir Garrett could go out and have a great month. Find him some lefty lanes. You're telling me he couldn't give you 10 games, 11 innings, and a 1.4 ERA? Like, he's done that and he can do that. 
to find you a seventh hole hitter that can give you an 800 OPS, not as easy. And that's where I've been banging the drum on this offense thing, and I think it matters. And that's where I want to take it into, uh, again, kind of another category. My fourth point, I, I didn't label this well. Uh, I labeled it intrigue peaking. It's just a really bad way to label it. But I guess here's, here's what I know, and this might confuse people. Seattle, Toronto, Tampa, Philly, Texas, these teams are good. But I know who they are. Like, Philly, they kind of have a sneaky, crazy resume going right now. Um, Toronto's still Toronto. They're going to pitch a little bit. There's going to be days where their dudes go off offensively. Tampa's Tampa. I mean, that's the easiest thing to label ever. The Seattle Mariners, I think there's going to be days where they get special pitching. I think there's days... Where their guys go. There's going to be days when they get enough offense. Like, you, we kind of know what they are. The intrigue peaking teams that I wrote down, I wrote down Boston. They danced with Seattle this weekend. They've got a funky-looking team going right now. But think about the speech I just gave. The question with Boston is, can they pitch enough? Uh, and they've got a couple guys that can pitch enough. Uh, Bayo, everyone's waiting for the next step. So uh, very young. Cutter Crawford, sneaky, was, <laughs> was good last year. Uh, Pavetta. The stuff has, like, always been there. So if, the, if is that light bulb going to go on? Uh, Whitlock and Hauk are two talented pitchers. Most people's questions about them are, can they hold up as a starter throughout a season? Um, the bullpen looks thin on paper in Boston, but it goes back to the whole speech I just gave about hitting, uh, and they've got guys in their lineup. If Tyler O'Neill goes off, which he did this opening weekend, um, they're going to get offense between Devers, Story, Yoshida, Duran. I, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. The other thing that Boston kind of turned some heads with this weekend, and this is where I do need to give Mr. Schoenfield the assist, uh, outfield defense. Uh, the Red Sox World Series team famously had some of the best outfield defense ever. Mookie Betts, uh, Gold Glove Benny, and Jackie Bradley Jr., who we just found out in an article, was coaching up Soto's defense, so watch out for that. Um, Rafaela in the outfield covers a ton of ground. He kicked Jaron Duran, who was really good defensive center fielder, to left field, uh, and that has Tyler O'Neill, who also played a lot of center field, to right field. So the Red Sox... They're going to get offense. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to sort out, but I like the amount of pieces they have. They're going to get offense. They're going to get some pitching. To what level, I don't know. And they've got some outfield defense. So, okay, like we have a team identity. We have something we're doing. What does it mean in the AL East? I don't know. But this is a team that, in the rudest, trying not to be rude, but being honest, People didn't care about their offseason so much because the Red Sox can't be better than the Orioles, the Yankees, the Rays, and the Blue Jays. Can they be better than one of those teams? Yeah. Can they be better than two of those teams? Maybe. It's baseball. Some help. Uh, so the Red Sox, they survived the Mariners. They're getting a West Coast trip kind of out of the way, if you want to view it as that. They're about to play three in Oakland. Handle your business, and you got a winning West Coast road trip to start the season? Um, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid for what the Sox are doing. Uh, but they turn some heads a little bit. And I know their their fans are very excited about Andrew Bailey, the new pitching coach, and, and they think something's 
that's like a tangible thing that's changed with like how everybody did their springs and all that. So they're incredibly encouraged by the pitching top to bottom from, yeah. from that opening series. Um, and then the, the other two teams I wrote down and maybe I could have just put central in big letters, but, uh, Detroit and Cleveland, D- Detroit became a sexy pick before the season to try to sneak up on the AL central. Um, is that their talent? Is it kind of what I've, their pitching is half set. It's how much can they get from their lineup? And they have two young guys along with some other bodies that have a chance to click, um, you know. Kerry Carpenter doesn't turn a lot of heads on the big league or at just the general fan level, but if he plays to what he did last year or gets better, uh, they called up Colt Keith before the season. Uh, if that Tigers lineup can put enough together, they can be a ball club. Jack Flaherty shoved this weekend, our guy guy. Um, and I don't know. I've, I've kind of been a fade the fade of the sexy team before the season because it feels like one of those things that the offseason just starts getting in your head that you just start saying stuff and hoping. Um, The Tigers had some steam. They're going to pitch enough. It's can they hit enough. Um, And that's still a question for me. But the other team, the Cleveland Guard Dogs hit a little bit this weekend. They played Oakland, um, so I'm not going to do anything with that. But again, I've liked their pitching. Uh, And Cookie Carrasco did make the team, which is hilarious. Um, That's nice. And we knew it was going to happen. Um. But, yeah, for them, it's how much offense are they going to get. And Quan Jimenez went off. They got some big big swings from other people. It does currently list Florial as their starting DH. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just about to say, do you see who's DH? Looks like two of the last three games. It, and it, it, it is Esteban Florial. I mean, that's wild. I kind of I kind of need to tell Jimmy that on camera. Um, so, yeah, that just talked myself down from Cleveland. But I... There's intrigue in both central division. I could have put Pittsburgh on this list. If you go, if you listen to our team profile and pro- projection on Pittsburgh, I was dead set on taking the under. And then I kind of looked through their lineup and I was like, wait a second. The Pirates have a lot of things that can click. It's a it, sneaky, complete lineup. Like, hey, you give me a 1 1 pick at catcher hitting seventh, Henry Davis? I don't know. What are we saying about him at the end of the year? Rowdy Telez got the contract from them. He had a big homer over the weekend. He's put together full MLB seasons. If he does one of those, that lineup is very interesting. Old McCutcheon has just gotten on base the past couple years. Uh, Jack Sawinski can hit. He, Brian Hayes. I've had Pittsburgh Pirates fans telling me how good he is. The weird thing is I've been agreeing with them. They just want me to put him as the S-tier third baseman, which he's not. I hope he's competing for it. If, if he does what he did May the, on last yeah. year for a full year this year, we'll talk. Give me a full season. Let's see it. I, I am excited about him. Connor uh, Joe's raking. Brian Reynolds, O'Neal Cruz. Like that's, I was pretty dead set on taking their under, um, and I took their over on the team profile and projection because I think they can get enough out of the lineup. I was originally scared by their pitching, but now they're pitching. Jared Jones, a kid, gave them a good outing. Mitch Keller's Mitch Keller. I think he's a pretty good 28-year-old arm kind of peaking. Is he a one? Is he a three? I don't know, but he's going to give you good MLB outings. Uh, Martin Perez. That guy's pitched in the show for a while. I can, he can drop seven shut on you. He can also get knocked around some days. Um, Eat some innings at least. If these pirates hang around and they call up a Paul Skeens, um, Quinn Priester is a young pitcher for them. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the intrigue level got turned up on a couple teams, and it's the first weekend. And what does intrigue mean? Because, again, I want to say it complementary to the other teams that I, I kind of know the Blue Jays sauce. I, I kind of know the Rays sauce. kind of know what Seattle is. Um and, you know, three of those five teams will be good in the playoffs. Two might get bumped out. And are they going to get bumped out by a Detroit? Are they going to get bumped out by a Pittsburgh? It's early. Um, but that's what I saw. My last one. And Dave Schoenfield had this, too. It, Mets are just a disaster class. 
It's going to get ugly over there. I, opening weekend, you shouldn't overreact, and the Brewers have always had high-end pitching, so to start the season, they saw Freddie Peralta, they, you know, Abner Uribe. Brewers, Brewers are supposed to be solid this year. They're always kind of solid. The Mets are always kind of not. This year's not supposed to be a winning year for them. McNeil's getting some hate right out of the gate. Rhyme. Alonzo contract okay. year. Sevy, who's, you know, is our guy. We love, we love who Sevy is. His pitching's been kind of tough. I hope I can look back and say it's an opening weekend over reaction. This Mets team didn't have real goals going into the season. A reminder, they traded away Scherzer, Verlander for prospects. Otherwise, those guys could be on this team this year. And I don't know, man. For me, that was just a head turn of like, wait, the because I've been saying that in a positive way. I've been like, you know, the Mets might be punchy this year. They don't have real, uh, you know, may, maybe they'll play spoiler. And, hey, J.D. Martinez is supposed to be on this team. And could that be good for their lineup? I'm Mets out, man. Uh, what I saw this weekend, it, it was just kind of an ugly reminder. And maybe I'm just being a rude-ass Yankee fan that saw something he liked this weekend. But, ah. Uh, I'm so turned off by the Mets. And seeing it in Dave Schoenfield's article, that kind of drove that home for me too. Um, so, there's a lot of action from around the league this weekend. Uh, long story short, it's three or four games. Your team could wash that immediately. Uh, and I, I said this on Talking Baseball, but I've been laughing pretty good at like opening day stats. I think Tyler O'Neill's homered in five straight opening days. So that's that's something. Uh, Alex Cora was zero and five on opening day, and now he's one and six. I think it's just so funny that the second day of the season counts just as much, but nobody cares. Opening day has a we has keep, a mystique. We keep opening day stats, but nobody keeps second day stats. Nobody nobody keeps just like you know. June 16th stats. They are each one game, a day apart usually. And one has stats for it forever, and one you will never hear about. Quickly Googleable stats. Judge has a hit in all eight opening days he's uh, played. Look at that. That Look was one that. I, I stumbled into this weekend. I think... We may have a fun guest this week. Uh, before I do that, uh, I'll just tell you, and you know, if you need me to dig up receipts again, the UConn men are going to win the national title. Um, and I've been trying to tell you this now. When the brackets came out, I placed my original bet on DraftKings uh, January 2nd, and I think I told the good people here, uh, they are... Maybe the most dominant college basketball team of all time. Other people are saying this. I saw it click early. Stephon Castle, who's probably going to be the highest draft pick from this team, uh, they were the best team in the country before the light bulb went off for him. And they're just, they're just, they went on a 30 and 0 run in the Elite Eight. 30 to nothing in an Elite Eight game. Um, and I know I was complimenting the, the women because I think tonight is going to be an all-time night for, for women's basketball. Whatever you're doing, I, I beg of you on Saturday to watch the NC State-Purdue game because you just have a dream big man matchup. DJ Burns on NC State is one of the widest college basketball players you've ever seen. Again, I tried to bring your attention. I made BBD look him up after they won the ACC tournament. You got a live reaction on air. Um, he is probably 6'9", 3", blah, blah, blah. Thick, knows it, loves it. He has fun when he plays, and he's so skilled. And he's going to be going up against 7'4", Zach Eady who kind of plays the opposite way. 
stoic, mean, uh, and just 7-4 that people... Those two are going to be matched up for 40 minutes. I don't know how it ends. It's probably Purdue, uh, and they're a little bit foul merchants because Edie's just a different size human being. He Hmm. gets fouled a lot. Um, And, yeah, whoever wins that game gets to lose to UConn in the championship. So, uh, college basketball, having a moment. I like that for them. Uh, but the big winner this weekend, baseball. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, think we got a fun guest uh, coming for the midweek. And make sure you subscribe. Thank you, guys.